How many of you have tried out Rust? That's not bad, great. It's actually not that, that makes my talk more or less useless. <laughs> but for those of you who haven't, hopefully this will give you guys a brief intro into what Rust is about. This talk is not a tutorial into Rust. It's more of, uh, I will cover salient features of Rust that I find interesting. And maybe we can have a discuss further discussion on them. Maybe I and a disclaimer here is that I'm not an expert. I only started, started learning Rust recently. So if you guys see any mistakes, feel free to point them out. All right? And to guys who are from a C, C++ background who feel a superiority complex, <laughs> feel free to air it out as well. All right? that, it'll be quite fun. So uh, let's start the talk. So how many of you do systems programming at work? Okay, I only see like very few hands. You know why, right? It's because it sucks right now, <laughs> right? Why does it suck? Oh, uh, yeah. This, but just a bit before I go there, just a bit about me. My name is Omar. I work as an iOS developer at Karina. I don't do systems programming language, systems programming work at work either. So I can't blame anyone. So the reason why it sucks is. Uh, it's quite deep, but I'll give you a clue. Uh, how many of you know what this is? Yes, it's quite cool. It's a bug with a logo. Like, how many of your bugs have logos? Like, I don't suppose anyone has a bug with a logo. Uh, you, you might actually. You work on security, right? Like, you might have bugs with logos. But this is not the only bug with a logo. Uh, a bit more information about those who have not heard of Heartbleed. A uh, Heartbleed is a bug in OpenSSL. It's, and this bug caused basically results from a very simple reason. The simple reason is there's a buffer overread happening that exposes some data that allows an attacker to basically break the encryption uh, and, it, and it, it get access to data you should not have access to. It's quite a simple issue if you think about it. But the fact that this issue occurs in OpenSSL, a library that's been open source for so long and has been wetted through so many times, this is something that's slightly alarming. And it tells us something is not right with the state of things. And this is not the last security bug, right? I mean, for those of you who follow security matters, there's new CVEs coming out every, every few months, like big ones, every day, I believe, for you. Right? Every hour. You have to bring them out, it's your job, right? <laughs> so, I mean, there's this one, Shell Shock. It's also another bug with a logo. You might have heard of it. It was quite hot a few years ago. Uh, there's this go to fail. You guys have a go to fail? It's yeah. a very famous uh, bug in Apple, Apple's implementation. Uh, pretty funny bug. There's this thing called Sandworm. It's uh, apparently it affects Windows systems. Uh, and like the point is, the point is that we have a lot of vulnerabilities in these common, essential systems level libraries that we all use all the time. Why is it so? Why isn't it that these libraries are completely correct and valid for us to use? Why are these, these kind of issues? And if you boil it down, right, it boils down to the fact that the languages that these libraries and frameworks are implemented in give you a lot of control. They let you do almost everything. They give you too much freedom. And here's a quote I have from the creator of C++. Uh, be honest with true, who essentially says that C++ makes it quite easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Like, it, when, you, when you do it, it'll actually blow your whole leg off. Because it's that powerful. It's like, it, you're basically, you're basically uh, driving with no safety. I have another quote here from uh, another great philosopher of the 20th century. Uh, you know, all guys might know him. His name is uh, Uncle Ben. Uncle Ben says, uh, with great power comes great bugs, actually. Because, once again, because you have so much control, because you have ac direct access to memory, and you can manipulate whatever it, however you want, uh, naturally that it makes it quite easy to introduce certain, certain kinds of bugs that will only be detected at runtime. So, with this context, uh, in particular, when we're talking about safety, and we're talking about bugs, I'm talking about memory safety, and I'm talking about bugs related to dealing with memory. 
But what exactly am I talking about? I'm talking about things like buffer overflows. Buffer overflows occur when you have objects in memory and then so you have a length check missing somewhere over there in your implementation, you forgot to check the length and then suddenly you overwrite into some other object's memory. Then you have things like buffer overreads where you read, once again, you have a missing length check somewhere, you have an off by one error somewhere and you somehow tend to read into some other object's memory. Things like dangling pointers where you have the address of an object that's actually been deleted and now that object is not pointing to anything, so when you access it, it'll crash, it'll cause a kernel panic or whatever. You have things like double freeing a pointer where, which can corrupt the heap in some implementations. And there's a bunch of other similar related memory bugs. And these bugs are quite, are quite often, if you deal with languages like C and C++, where you have direct access to memory or where you need, to, where you need direct access to memory in order to do whatever uh, programming that you're doing. So, the response in general to these kind of issues, obviously, is GC it, bro. Like, garbage collectors rock. Why don't you use a garbage collector? Why are you dealing with manual memory management at all? GC solved this problem a long time ago. And for those of you uh, who are wondering like, what I'm talking about, like garbage collection, when I'm referring to garbage collection, I'm referring to garbage collection in, uh, in languages like Java, in, in languages like Java, JVM, uh, or Ruby's mark and sweep garbage collector, aka like any, you have an active garbage collector that actually can accumulate garbage over time and then you're going to mark and mark it and then going to sweep it afterwards. So maybe it can be paused the world, it may not be paused the world, doesn't matter. The point is we have very strong, very smart, very efficient garbage collector, well, garbage collector implementations out there right now. The JVM has been optimized for this particular use case so much that there's a whole science into optimizing the garbage collector of, of our JVM. So why can't we use the JVM or why can't we use similar garbage collection mechanisms in systems programming languages directly? There doesn't seem to be an obvious problem, but there is, sadly. And that problem, the biggest problem by far, is that your destruction of memory when you're running a garbage collector uh, is non-deterministic. So, this is a problem where, especially so in systems programming languages, because you want to be able to have that direct level of control. So if you're, if, you're, if you're implementing a driver and you want to release some buffer that is, sup, that is super massive immediately before you do something else, you need to make sure that that buffer is destroyed before you do anything else. You can't rely on the GC that, oh, eventually the GC will clear it and my, my, my very light framework or my very light, very, my very light driver will still work fine. You need to be very deterministic about when your object is actually going to be destroyed in a systems programming language. Another problem with GCs is that the GCs require, GC uh, systems like JVM, they need a lot more memory than your actual process in order to be efficient. If you don't provide them that much memory, they'll start thrashing and, they, and the efficiency of the GC will be a lot, a lot, a lot less. So this, is, this has repercussions because this means that for systems programming, when you're talking about programming OS's, kernels, drivers, you need to be as fast as possible and as memory efficient as possible, which may not always be, which won't be possible if you have this kind of limitation. So you can't have GC, if you only have, like if you're talking about like embedded systems, for example, where you only have 32 kilobytes of RAM available to you and half, the GC is doing half of that, that's not gonna be very optimal for whatever use case you're planning to use it for. Another problem with GCs, and this is something that's not mentioned as often, is that GCs are often power inefficient. And that's because they often have to do RAM sweeps in order to clear memory. And when, every time you do a RAM sweep, this, a RAM sweep inherently is quite expensive in terms of power. So this is one of the reasons why Apple decided not to adopt a garbage collector for Objective-C, for example. So, so uh, Chris Lattner talked, talked about this in length recently in a podcast, whereby one of the reasons why they didn't continue with Objective-C garbage collection in iOS is because GCs would lead to pretty bad power, power efficiency, so they, they use something called automatic reference counting instead, which I'll, I might touch later on. Another problem is GCs have this thing 
whereby they might pause the execution of your entire program in order to do garbage collection. This is not true of all GCs. Like JVM has done, and some very mature garbage collectors have very efficient ways to do this, whereby they might use separate processes, etc. But regardless, there may be some GC pauses. And a GC pause, if you're dealing with software like an air traffic control system, is not acceptable. You don't want your plane to crash because your JVM is collecting memory for those 100, for those 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds. That kind of uh, delay is not acceptable for a hard view of that system. So that's why garbage collection is not the answer, sadly. And with that context, that's where Rust comes in, right? So Rust aims to provide a memory model whereby you can get away with memory safety without having to resort to garbage collection. And we look at how it does that. But first, as a detour, I want to show you how easy Rust's Hello World is. It's only three lines of code, so we already win. We already beat C and C++, right? There's no hash import, uh, hash include, IO stream, using namespace, blah, 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 right? So already to 90% of the audience, I think I've already won, so I think I'll stop here. I don't need to continue. But for those of you who are interested, let's go on a bit further. So what is Rust? Rust is a systems programming language that is focused on three goals. Safety, speed, and concurrency. Today, we will be focusing on the safety aspect of it. In particular, memory safety. So, when it comes to safety, uh, Rust encourages or rather forces you to have immutability by default. So here is some Rust code that I, I'll show you guys. Uh, if I declare a variable called let x equal 10, and I try to assign it to something else, it'll throw a compiler error because variable assignments in Rust are immutable by default. You can't reassign stuff. If you want to reassign, reassign a variable, you have to mark it with this mute uh, label, mute keyword, if you want it to be mutable. This is a good thing because Usually, in most languages, like C, C++, immutability is not the default. Immutability is the default. If you want immutability, you have to use const, etc., etc., etc. And this is a, I mean, this is a pretty good thing because this means, by default, most of our variables will, most of our variables, we don't have to worry about mutating them. Okay. The other thing about Rust is that, oh, what's something wrong with here? Okay. The other thing about Rust is that it is strongly typed. And it's strongly typed with type inference. So you do not always have to provide type signatures to your variables. You can provide it. So like for example over here I declare a variable x42 which I say is of type in 32. But similarly if I declare another variable y, in the second scenario uh, Rust will automatically infer the type based on the value you provided. So you don't always have to provide values to, uh, don't always have to provide type definitions to Rust. Okay. Yeah, sure. Question from the annoying task programmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so. so the, the type inference in the details, is that like directional or is it like we will go to space or like define, then use y somewhere as a float? I'm not entirely sure the full extent of it, but what I do know is that it's not very good. Like, the, 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 it's nowhere near as good as Haskell's, it's not Hindi Milne, it's not that class at all. It's very basic in the sense that for functions, you always have to provide type, def, type definitions, always. But within a function body, you can infer. So I'm not sure... It's like C -sharp. Yeah. I suspect I have something like that, or something like TypeScript, for example. Like it's a very, it's not a very smart type, type it's not a fully thought through type inference mechanism. The reasoning for that is, the reasoning at least they, they just they claim is that in Haskell, even though in Haskell you can infer types always, you don't need to, need to provide function definitions. It's good practice to do so. So we're going to make compulsory anyway. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a good number type. 
side and four side an integer until it's unspecified, but it can't be anything that's before. So uh, that, because it has to be as before, it has to specifically have a specific Okay, can I answer? Can you come in? Like, can you repeat what you said? Oh, so it's, it's considered a generic kind of integer value type, um, but not as a floor. And you need to have the best in the floor. Oh, yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's true, that's true, that's good. Yeah. yeah, that's good. All right. Uh, okay, so let's carry on. Uh, I'm going to look at, look at vectors for a bit, because vectors are what I'm going to use to explain the memory concepts later in, later in the talk. So, Ross is vectors, and the way you declare a vector is very simple. It's just let v equals vec exclamation mark and you write a list of sorts. Uh, this exclamation mark thing is a macro. Uh, we'll discuss more, more on macros later. But the main point here is this thing will instantiate a vector of type uh, int32 inside it. And uh, our vectors will store content on the heap. Okay, this is important. And we'll go into this a bit later. Anyone not familiar with stack versus heap? What hap what's the what's the drawback? What's what's it do? What does it do, etc. Okay, no worries. I will go into it very briefly soon. Uh, so, with that, just that, just that, it's enough for us to go into the memory model of Rust and what makes Rust special. So, Rust's philosophy in general is zero cost abstractions, meaning that whatever abstraction they give to you, whatever feature Rust provides to you, it should have no performance cost and no cost to run time. So they try to maximize whatever they can at compile time rather than you worry, rather than impose certain restrictions on you at runtime that will affect performance and stuff. So keeping that in mind, the first concept they have in Rust memory model is this concept of ownership. And ownership means that variable bindings have ownership. They own whatever they're bound to. So for example, if I declare uh, this variable here in this function, v equals a vector of 1 to 3, the variable binding b has ownership of the vector. Vec of the vector. And this also means that when this binding will go out of scope, Rust will free the bound resources. So the moment this thing will go out of scope, even though it's on the heap, it will be free. So you don't need to have a free statement there, or release, or whatever, or delete, if you come from C++. Rust will free it for you, regardless of whether it's on stack, heap, etc. And yeah, in this case, V on the heap is going to be cleaned up. So this is great, but there are some uh, caveats to it. Uh, oh, just to clarify, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about when I refer to stack versus heap. Here's a very simple diagram uh, to briefly explain it. So let's say I have a vector v, 1 to 3, and I have some variable i equal to a number 42, which is a primitive. So my program stack, which will push new labels whenever they come into scope and will pop them when they go out of scope, will look something like this. I have v, which is a vector, and it has this little object that's stored on the stack. This object holds an address to the memory in, on the heap, which actually stores the content of the vector. And it stores some other data that might be useful for quick access. So things like the size of the vector will be stored on, the, on this object on the stack. Okay? Similarly, uh, for this variable i on the stack, the value 42 is stored directly on the stack because it's a primitive and our registers are big enough to easily hold it, no problem. So that's like a very simple view into stack, stack and heap. Uh, so one of the issues with ownership is Rust will ensure that there is only one binding to a given resource at a particular time. So what that means is but if I do something like this, where I assign, where I have a vector v, then I create another uh, vector v2 and assign it equal to v, 
and then I try to print the value inside V0, this thing will actually give me a compile time error, saying error looks like this, use of move value V. Uh, the error might be confusing, but what it means is that this ownership has moved from V to V2. So V no longer can be used, as a, uh, it no longer owns the resource, it can no longer be used. So, why does it do this? This is not exactly very uh, intuitive. So why does it do this actually? Uh, the reason it does it is if we had to, uh, if, we, if, if we allowed to reference, if we allowed two uh, labels to refer to the same vector, right? The problem that would result is we would have two pointers pointing to the address uh, of, the, of this, of this uh, on the, the two pointers owning this resource. And if you have any modifications, hold on a second. If you have any modifications to the resource, uh, if you have any modifications to the size, for example, those changes might not be, uh, might not affect the other ref other reference holding holding the ho holding the same uh, what you call uh, holding the same vector. So that's the main reason why ownership only goes one way. You can only have one owner, one uh, label owning uh, reference. So the way ownership ownership works is so let's say we have. Let's say you have code like this, where you have a function and you pass this function, you pass a vector into this function. All right. So v owns this vector now, and inside this function, this local variable v will own this vector. Okay. And what happens here is not important, but afterwards, when you try to print the value of v, this thing will again give you this little, this error again. And this is like what the hell? I can't use this anymore because this vector has actually, the value of this has already moved ownership to this label and then it moved ownership to this in this label and now it's gone. So how am I supposed to program with this kind of model, right? How are we supposed to do anything with this, with this kind of stuff? Uh, let me go into a bit more into why this is so. <coughs> so the reason this is so is Let's say I have, let's say I'm counting the number of votes that Donald Trump won in the last election, right? Let's say this thing is stored as a vector. And let's say that this is what the vector looks like. It ha he only has three votes right now. Only three people voted for him right now. And let's say I want to smudge up the vote numbers a bit. And I declare a mutable, uh, I, I declare a mutable uh, reference. I'm going to say a clear immutable variable where I try to own own the vector and then I try to change it. Okay, so I change it over here in this in this one. What would the ownership look ownership mechanism look like when it comes to stack and heap? So if you look at it, I now have two vectors: once my actual votes, once my fake votes, and my actually my heap size has increased. The actual data on the heap has increased because I pushed one more variable there. But the variable, this thing is not corrupted because this data that I stored on the stack is no longer valid. And this is the main reason why, uh, like I mentioned before, Rust does not allow you to have multiple owners. You can only own, have one owner for a particular, for any particular data on the heap. What about, if that's the case, right, then what about, uh, one easy way to get around it is to do copying. This is something we do in many other languages to prevent multiple references from corrupting or something. Oh, we, and we can do that actually for primitive types. Because Rust by default, if you have for example code like this, this code will compile. And this code will compile because numbers are a primitive type. And they implement this thing called the copy tray which allows you to copy over memory. So every time you actually do an assignment, it's not actually going to move the resource into and assign it to another, another identifier. It will just copy the value over. You can do this for any data type, but this is actually quite expensive to do if you do it for all your data types. 
So this is not the right way, obviously. Another issue is that if you own, if you use ownership and you want to, let's say you're only using ownership to do to do your programming, and if you have a function that you want to pass stuff to, every time you pass stuff to it, you have to return those identifiers back so you can use them again. Because once again, as the rules say, you can only have one identifier at a time pointing to a particular resource. So if you are doing uh, if you're doing a function call, for example, over here I have a function that takes two vectors and returns a tuple of two vectors and some number. And every time I do this, I will have to return the vectors back. Although actually in this case, I don't actually want to do anything with the vectors. I only want my numeric result. I don't have a choice because in order to use the vectors ever again, I have to pass them back. Because as the rule, that's what the rules of ownership say, which is obviously not the right way to program. Like if you program that way, that's not going to work. So, in order to get around this, Rust has another concept called borrowing. And the way borrowing the the way borrowing works is borrowing allows you to refer to something that's already owned, and uh, what you call do stuff with it. But there are certain rules associated with it. So for example, over here, I pass this and operate, and looking operator, this and looking sign. This and looking sign means that instead of doing a, instead of owning the resource, let this other person borrow it instead. And when you borrow it, you don't actually uh, own the resource anymore. You are just, you just have a view into what the resource is. So in this case, if I do this, this thing will compile fine. And I don't need to pass my I don't need to pass my vectors B1, B2 in the result anymore. So this and right is actually a reference. And reference, like I mentioned, will borrow ownership rather than owning the resource itself. And the main difference between ownership and references is that the resource will not be dialogued when the reference goes out of scope. So there is the main problem with us having to pass the references, pass the resources along when we are doing ownership is that if we don't do that, the moment it goes out of scope, the resource will be released and you won't have access to it anymore. But you don't need to worry about it for references because references will not dialogue anything. Okay? So uh, in my diagram over here, I will refer, I will use this dotted arrow as a reference. And this white arrow is on ownership. Okay, so this is the same thing. So these both point to the same uh, what you call array, same data on the heap. And uh, yeah, this thing is a, this thing is only the resource. This thing is just a reference to the resource. Okay. Uh, one of the issues with references is so let's say I code like this, whereby I create a vector. Then I call a function where I try to change the value of this vector using the reference itself. This thing will throw an error. The error will be, you cannot borrow and you borrow content, blah, blah, blah. So the main gist of it is that references are immutable. That means that you cannot mutate a ref you mutate the content inside a reference uh, by default. This is a good thing, and this is why it's safe to create as many references as you want, because you're not actually ever going to change anything. It's just a way for you to access the actual content of the data, but you, do not, you never actually change it. So this is great, but what if I actually do want to change stuff? There is something called a mutable reference. It has a special keyword called unmute. And, uh, this this is how you declare a mutable reference. So over here, what I do is I declare a mutable value called five, and I de then in this scope block I declare a y, which is a mutable reference to x. And if I want to change the value of x inside x, I will have to de, -re de refer y using the star pointer, and then I can change the value to do whatever I want. So this is how I would, I would do 
mutation using mutable references in Rust. And one of the things you have to notice here is that in order for this to work, the variable x, the original variable x, also needs to be marked with the mute, mute keyword. The reason is that if you try to borrow, if you try to do a borrow mute reference, if you try to do a mutable reference from an immutable value, it will actually give an error, which makes sense because you should not be doing that. And the star here, as I mentioned, is needed to access the content of the reference. And you might be wondering, why did I need to add these braces? Why did I need to create a new scope for this to work? I'll get into that now. So naturally, for borrowing, there's a few rules that Rust forces you to, forces you to follow at compile time. If you don't follow these rules, the memory model will break down. The first rule is that if you're doing borrowing and you have a reference, you cannot last for a scope that is greater than the owner. This makes sense. It makes sense because if you do that, you have a dangling pointer by definition, right? So the other thing, the other rule they have is that you can only have one mutable reference exclusively or you can have as many uh, references as you want, one or more. As so basically you cannot have a mutable reference and an immutable reference at the same time. You have to, you can only have one mutable reference at any given point in time in your program. Okay? And this makes sense as well. Because if you look at it, this is the definition of a data race. A data race would occur if two pointers access the, look, access the memory location at the same time and one of them is writing on the other, one of them is reading. Right? This would lead, this sort of condition would lead to a data race. But if by definition, or by if we can ensure at compile time that you only have one reference that is writing at any point in time, then you will not face this problem. And no one else is reading at that, at that point in time. Then you will not have this problem at all. You will have not have to worry about data races. And this is how Rust, like this is how Rust makes sure that you don't can do a whole host of memory memory bugs that would occur otherwise. So let me look at this and do a bit more. Like let me show this example. Uh, here I have an example where I have a mutable variable called x. So it's the same example as before, except that I don't have the braces, the nested braces. And I do a borrow with y, then I try to add, and then I try to print the value of x. Okay? And this thing will give me a compile time error saying that it cannot borrow x as immutable because it is also borrowed as immutable. What this means is I have two references right now. I have a mutable reference and I also have an immutable reference pointing to my variable x. So why is, my, why is the mutable, mutable re reference and I have a mut and I have an immutable reference in the print? Because when you print something, it will actually create an immutable reference to whatever you're printing. And this thing will then fail because of that. So that's the reason why I need to add a scope, a scope uh, inside here, so that when y goes out, if you look at the previous example, if when y goes out of scope, it will automatic the reference will be gone. It will be a thrown out of memory, and it's no longer there. So then, in that case, this is okay because I only have one immutable reference now. I don't have a mutable reference anymore in this particular case. So similarly, references cannot live longer than the resource they are pointing to. So for example, if I have some code here where I have a reference y and inside this block I have a variable x equal 5 and try to assign this assignment where I try to assign the reference y to the variable x. Uh, this will also throw a compile time error saying that x does not live long enough for y to be referenced to it. So this is in short compile time, which is great. I don't need to worry about this anymore. So that's it. That's the entirety of Rust's memory model. And with these two uh, guarantees, you will lose a whole host of bugs that, are, that can otherwise occur. There's a few more concepts of Rust that are interesting that I'll go down with, that I'll just demo out. Uh, one of them is structs. Uh, as in, structs are simple in Rust. 
you, this is how you declare a struct. It's just like if I have a struct called point, I just do the type definition, and I can use this constructor that's available for free. And I can, if I want to do a mutable version of this struct, I can just uh, use the mute operator to create a mutable own label in this case, or own reference to this struct. One of the things to note about structs, however, is that there is no field level mutability for structs. So by default, all your either all your fields are immutable or all your fields are immutable. So you can't have a field level, you can't have something like, like in, in class that you have like a one to something is read only and something is not read only. Uh, to do that, you as in uh, the reason the reason that is so is because mutability in Rust is a property of the binding, it's not a property of the, the, the of the object itself. And you can do it if you really need it by using mutable pointers if you really, really need field level mutability. So you can have a box inside, uh, for example. But it's but by default you don't get it. So that, that's interesting. Another thing to note is struct allows you structs, it also allows you to, to have methods on structs. So for example, let's say I have a, I have a method called uh, area that I want to implement on this struct called circle. I can implement like this. I can just declare a function, I have this implementation block, and this thing returns uh, floating point 64 bit and this, this is quite straightforward. The in, only interesting thing here is that the method, when you refer to self, you can refer to yourself in three ways. You can either have, you can either borrow self with a reference using and, you can own self, so in that case you won't see this uh, and here, and in that case, you like you know the memory, some memory course, memory, uh, what you call uh, problems with that. And you can have a mutable reference to self as well. So this is something interesting that you can have methods that use either of those uh, based on whatever your need, needs are. Yeah. If you want to mutate, if you use and self, obviously you cannot mutate the fields that you have because you are not a mutable reference, you are an immutable reference. So if you want to use, if you want to mutate, you should use uh, and mute. And mute self. Another thing that's interesting about Rust is uh, static and dynamic dispatch. So what this means is, uh, so Rust will default to static dispatching. And uh, what, what this actually means is, I'll get into, get into it in a bit more detail, but the main reason they do that is because it allows several optimizations like inlining your function calls. So let me just give you an example of why that matters at all to people using Rust. Let's say I have a function called add because I don't like the add operator and I want to redefine add. Let's say I'm a functional programmer and I, I don't like using the plus operator and I only like this kind of syntax. So, Let's say I redefine add as this function, uh, and I use this function in some in some code. If I'm not in line, this function will probably generate some assembly code that looks something like this, which basically means that you basically push the argument, you set some registers for stack state, you push the arguments, you call the function, then you put the res you call the function, then you put the result somewhere, then you pop all the registers back. Right? That's what normally happens in the function call. You will have some uh, say registers that you have to set, you need to push some params, call the, call the function, put this to result somewhere, then pop all the registers back. However, if you inline your inline your function, what will happen is the instruction that will produce is something like this. The list of the add, instru add instruction directly. And the reason, the reason the compiler can do this is because it will expand the code when it's inlining instead of calling a method every time the function is called. So this allows like a lot of nice compiler optimizations. However, there are some scenarios where, oh, so this thing is called uh, static. So this thing, is the, this thing is the main advantage for using static dispatch. For those of you who don't know what static dispatch, static dispatch means that you have a fixed address for, the, for whatever method that you're calling. Whereas in dynamic dispatch, you will try to calculate the address of Based on at runtime. It's also a matter of optimization. So if you produce generics, I saw that you have generics. Yes. Yeah. For the static, static dispatch. Yeah. 
you will optimize also the, the compile time according to the, the implementation that you have for the, for the generic time. Yes. So it's not only a matter of, of add, but it's also optimizing according to the, to the, to the generic time. Uh, that's that's that, that's right. That's right. Also, a time. But but the point is that you, there are several compiler optimizations that you can do uh, when you have inlining available and you have type dis when you have type dispatch available, basically. So with dynamic dispatch, uh, this thing is kind of hard to do because you don't have the address available uh, at compile time. So in some scenarios, however, uh, dynamic dispatching is more effective, and the reason for this is. Uh, if you have some method that takes a generic type in Rust, for example, let's say I have a method do something, and this thing takes a generic type T, and this, and I have several implementations of this type for this type T. Like, let's say uh, I have something I want to do for a byte, and something else I want to do for a string. Well, the way Rust will actually implement uh, the, the code that, the Rust, that Rust will generate, will actually be different implementations based on each time. So that means that uh, you will actually have a lot of code uh, that if you have a, gener a type that, if you're using a type that extends to, that you, if you have a lot of types here, this, this thing can generate a lot of instructions. And this will, can load your code size, resulting in more instructions. So, like static dispatch by default may not always be quite smart. So the compiler is quite smart at choosing where whether to use dynamic dispatch or static dispatch in these kind of cases. So, aside from that, Rust also has support. Ah, so can you decide between the two? I mean, can you decide between having the static or the dynamic? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Ah, okay, so you can just. You can, if you want more control, and if you feel like you can do a better job in the compiler, you can actually specify. It has, they have a keyword where you, you can okay. specify for a method whether you want it to be static or dynamic. Okay. By default, however, it's basically depends on some heuristic that you Yeah, it, it has some heuristic that they... By default, it will, for most functions, I think it's static, but based it's on... Static. It's static by default, but I think if you have if you have generics, then I think they will use dynamic. But under some heuristics, I think. There's some, there's some heuristics that they use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rust also has, in, uh, has, option, has uh, enums, and they are a lot more powerful than enums that you might be used to in C++. They're actually option types. Uh, like from someone from Haskell who, or someone from a functional background, this is quite exciting. You can do stuff. You can actually pack data inside your enums. And this, while this might be something that's very normal for a functional programmer or someone from a Haskell or a Camel background, is something quite new in the systems programming world because C++ don't really have this. So you can, and you can, you can represent lots of different kinds of data using this. So for example, in this case, if I have a message type and it can be of different types, like if I can be a quit message, it can be change color where I provide some RGB values, it can be a move where I uh, change the XY coordinates, or it can be a write where I string. Like I can model all this, and all these will have the same type at the end of the day. So uh, this is good. It's good to have. Uh, Another thing that Rust is quite interesting is in how it deals with strings. So, Rust supports UTF-8 properly. It doesn't do a shoddy job of supporting UTF-8 by hiding it as UTF-8, UTF-16 characters or making this a sequence of null determinant bytes. Rust properly supports UTF-8 strings. What that means is that, uh, okay, I'll get into what that means in a bit. But basically when you declare a string, uh, static, statically allocated string, for example, like let's say you have just a static string over here uh, that's hard coded in your in your code. This thing will generate what we call a string literal of type. This thing is of type uh, str. Then this thing is statically allocated and it will exist for the entire duration of the program. It will basically be stored in, stored in the data segment of the program. However, if you want something, you want a string that's growable, they also have a different string type for that. It's called string, confusingly enough. And if you can convert strings from one type to the other. You can convert str to string. I don't know how, how they pronounce it actually when they, when they talk about it. But you can convert the static string into a dynamic, into a heap allocated string by this method. And 
similar to like some of the new programming languages like Swift, for example, Rust strings do not support indexing. What that means is that uh, if you have, if you want to find what character you're at in a string, it, you don't get that by default. And the reason they don't do this is because in a UTF-8 encoded string, actually when you index a character, it's actually an ON algorithm to do so. Uh, it's not an O1 algorithm. The reason is you have to walk for UTF-8 string to walk over the string to find what's the nth letter in that string. Because for UTF-8, a character can have uh, dynamics, can be a variable size. So there is an algorithm to go through the UTF-8 string in order to find what the actual nth character in terms of human representation is uh, at the end of the day. So in Rust, it gives you some helper methods to do that. But it also allows you to look at the byte representation of the string if you need it. So for example, over here I have this, this string, the Japanese string. And if I want to go through the characters, that is, oh sorry, that is the human readable characters of this string, I can do good, I can call this method for about cars. This will iterate through, is this an innumerable level, help me iterate through the characters one by one. But if I want to use the bytes, I can also use the bytes directly. So Rust makes this explicit to the programmer from the get-go. Uh, note about the Swift thing I mentioned. Swift actually is dropping this model and actually is going to make the string API easier in the next version. So it's no longer no longer like Swift, but yeah. Rust also has a foreign function interface. What that means is that you can integrate Rust code with C code. You can and you can expose Rust functions to be called from C. And this, is, this, this opens a lot of interesting possibilities. So here's a simple example of how to make it work. Uh, the gist of it is that if you want to call a function from C, you can declare it, you can declare something uh, it as an external function. And then you need to note the unsafe here. So unsafe is basically a safety hash you, or you saying, okay, Rust, I'll take control of the memory myself, don't need to worry about it. So if you put anything inside unsafe, the Rust borrow check, borrow check will not complain anymore. And inside this unsafe, you can call your C function directly and it should work fine. Uh, similarly, Rust functions can be called from C. And you can do, if you want to expose your function to the C world, or to any other uh, language with, with FFI, you can just mark the function as a public external function, and you can pass the no mangle meta argument in order to, so that the symbol name is not mangled when it generates when it generates the function name for you. So, uh, so this is great. This means that we can use Rust for more stuff than just systems programming language. Systems programming. And because Rust supports a large variety of architectures, so for example, it supports ARM, which is pretty, which is, which is what iOS and Android developers mostly develop for. Uh, the reason it can support ARM is because it uses LLVM under the hood, and, and it, it supports every architecture that LLVM supports. Uh, this means that we can do a lot of exciting stuff with Rust, not just do OSs, but we can do, for example, shared libraries. If you have iOS and Android clients and you want to do a library that you want to share between those clients. You don't have to write it in C++, you can write it in Rust, for example, and it will work fine because Rust will work fine on ARM, etc. So that's why I'm, I, as an iOS developer, find Rust quite fascinating and I can't wait to use it for an actual stuff, for actual stuff at, at work. With that, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. I have a question about the very last so how low can you go? Is there some runtime around the code which is committed by the Rust compiler? Would it like, theoretically be possible to what do you mean? Like, program a microcontroller in Rust? Yeah, you can program a microcontroller in Rust. As in, because anything you can do in C, you can do in Rust. Because Rust does not assume you have, uh, you, Rust does not assume you have like an OS available or what you call yeah, it doesn't have a runtime. It's a comp purely compiled language. So there's no, it doesn't assume any runtime is there. So it, it, it will work fine. You can, and it's being, you can use it to control microcontrollers quite easily. Yeah, you can use it without the standard library. Yeah, you can use it without the standard library. That's good. And it's not quite the most recent version of the Rust. And it's important for the CI and the speed of the 
Ah, oh, okay. So you don't get any of the same library, it's always like a domain. You're not making any programming less, but I'm very sure it's the same. Because it's not like, it's about the field. And the last time we checked, the answer for the last is where the cost comparison is. Is that in the file last one? You can, because if the rest will compile LLVM IR, because LLVM supports ARM fully, it's fine. It's not specific for online or anything like this, but compiling, running a Python RAS in ARM, I said we should not say Python. I couldn't find it, it's just that it was saying that we don't need to cross the file. That's interesting. I've seen references where you can compile it on iOS, for example. And it works fine. No, but I think you meant you want to compile on the native target without cross compiling from x86. That's what you meant. Yeah, like running on the compiler. I mean, you can just cross compile the compiler, I guess, right? If you want to compile on the target directly. You mean you want to run the compiler? I, I believe it doesn't want to cross compile, so it doesn't want yeah, to build yeah, on the laptop and then run on the target. Oh, it okay, to yeah. compile on the target directly. Yes, yes. I see, I see, I see. That's, I think that's his point. I see, I see, I see, I see. You can do that, like you mentioned. If you cross comp if you compile the uh, compile that. But I'm not sure, I'm not entirely sure actually. Uh, I, so. I'm pretty sure you can. Because the compiler is written. It's written in yeah, the past, yeah. 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 So, so I'm I'm almost certain because there's the different tiers of support for different architectures and ARM is about the highest tier of one or two. Uh uh X A six but it's not the same. So I'm almost certain. Any more questions? Have you viewed anything in Rust? Uh, very basic stuff. No, nothing, <laughs> nothing too fancy. I'm, I've got, I'm trying to, I'm thinking of using it for some projects at work, whereby we have to share libraries that we can port over to Rust. So, but we, haven't, we haven't started that yet. So do we have a view for this one? Something like, uh, or something Say what? Yeah, what? Oh yeah. There is a very good build tool. It's called Cargo. It's actually a very well-designed build tool that allows that does a lot of things. It does dependency management for you, for example. It will do things like setting up the project for you. It'll also do things like running tests, running uh, running your stuff, or building an executable, etc. Uh, it's quite well developed. Same time, like uh, what we have like the I mean, Jenkins is just a web. You can use Jenkins to run Cargo, for example. Jenkins is just a web. It's just a program that's running the web interface, right? You can call other programs inside inside Jenkins. So you can have a shell script that calls Cargo in your Jenkins configuration. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because of the compilation that we have there, you know, some something has to be done in the pipeline. Let's have some sort of, let's uh, compile Given that a, a, a similar program is C++, it must be that compiling was created some time ago. Ah, yeah, that's, 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 I think that's a problem right now. They, they haven't optimized it yet. I think compile times are will be definitely a lot slower than C C plus plus, definitely for large code bases. Okay. And that's something that I think they plan to work on. Right now they are focusing on making it more uh, friendly for more generic for more programmers. So but they haven't I think they haven't optimized compile times yet. It's still relatively quite new. <coughs> Okay. So if you if you run Rust on 19, you can use the internet application. Ah, uh, okay, okay. That will speed up a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the yeah. whole process. Yeah, okay. Like file wise or like file by file, incremental or even no. better? <laughs> it's it's about the other thing. There are many ways to do internet yeah. application, but, but and they, they are planning, I think, to import the feature of on the stable release of the source because it's one of the main okay. concerns yeah, of, yeah. of, yeah. of, the, of, the, of the developers. Yeah. Yes. It's quite fast. I try to I compare the incremental and incremental compilation okay. and it's quite fast. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I guess it's yeah. just a general Yeah. What resources do you suggest for people who are working in Rust? Oh, I saw I recommend the Rust Lang book. So there's this Google for a Rust Lang book. It's a very good resource for picking up Rust. Uh, it's pretty well 
uh, it's pretty easy, easy to go through and they, they, it's maintained quite actively by the community. So when new versions of Rust come in, people will submit pull requests to it and update it quite often. So that's the best resource by far. Uh, aside from Rust Lang book, I haven't, there, I recommend looking at what companies are doing with Rust. So, like, so one of the biggest projects that, with Rust is this project called Servo. Uh, which, so basically, the whole reason why Rust came about, the story of Rust is Mozilla wanted to re-implement its browser rendering engine, uh, well, and they decided that to implement a programming language to do that, and that's that's how Rust came about, basically. And they're using Rust to develop Servo right now. So I think that's the that's the, Servo would be a good guide into how would a big Rust project look like, or how to manage, or how to build a Rust, big Rust project. So, I'm not sure of any other very big projects using Rust yet. Yeah? Any good real prospects in the to Rust program? Developers, who will see me? Yeah, jobs. Job oh, job prospects, I'm not sure. <laughs> like it's, it's, I would say it's more of a, it's a tool that you can use. So if you're doing systems programming or if you're doing low-level stuff, then you can use this as a tool. But I'm not sure, I don't think, I'm not sure if there's anyone hiring the C++ or C developers. Or just like the other C++ developers. So, so I can see the other companies using Rust. Sorry? Rust. Rust. Sorry, Any companies in your restaurant? Yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, once again, I'm not entirely sure, aside from Mozilla. Chef. Yes. Yeah. Chef, I think. Website, Rust website, there's a yeah. list of yeah. friends yeah. of Rust yeah. that are yeah. companies using Rust in production. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And there are also job a lot of job openings for Rust developers. So they're yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we do job ones. So, yes. And then we do job ones. Actually, actually. Yeah. What's that? Which one? Dropbox, right, yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks, Oma. All right.